All right, volume two, uh, David Benatar, uh, Better Never to Have Been book. Yep, <laughs> I'm slowly getting, I yes, I, you know, I got to do this more regular. So we're going to do about three or four more pages of the introduction. Yeah, really should move on to the book, huh? Um, but there's stuff everywhere, good stuff everywhere. And uh, it's all kind of important. So anyway, yeah, I do, I have highlighted stuff from a few days ago. And so hopefully I'll remember what, uh, why I highlighted it. Um, anyway, so he says, I shall argue coming into to existence is always bad for those who come into existence, which is kind of a bold statement. But the bottom line is, is this is key to this addiction word. Because, yeah, I mean, we have positive experiences. There's no doubt that we feel something that seems like really good. And, uh, but yeah, it's good because we're addicted to it. Um, and that addiction even makes the experience of itself bigger than it actually was I mean in our perception I mean if we really put the raw feelings like how many times we felt really really great like ah perfect cigarette perfect beer perfect bench perfect view you know if we put those on one side of a scale and we were able to to, to compile all the sh really cruddy moments the 104 degree temperature chills, delusions, horror, suffering, pain, horrible pain for days uh, because something went wrong. Um, and put that stuff on the other side of the scale and do an honest evaluation, <clears throat> it would be pretty pretty obvious that, yeah, okay, this really doesn't make any sense. And the only thing that makes it make sense to people is this key word of addiction or desire. The fact that they are compelled to move forward. They're compelled to move towards this accomplishment thing, this I need to do more, I need one more donut, I need one more petting of the cat, I need one more thing. Um, we just aren't satiable. And that perverts the question. So, but yeah, I mean, it's a bold contention that really everyone's existence sucks. They just don't know it. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, but I would just argue I don't even have to go to that extreme. I don't have to prove that every life is crap. I just have to prove that, that, that on balance there's enough crappy life that's inevitable um, to say you really don't have... Well, yeah, there's three arguments. First, this is an imposition, so you can just argue right off the top that you don't have any right to have any failure because you're imposing. I mean, if you're going to impose something, you're going to give somebody your car to drive, well, you got to be sure the brakes work. You got to be sure everything's okay, or you're being a real asshole. Um, you know, and then the, we can go further on to the argument that yeah, you really can't account for any of this being broken uh, to justify what is um, just a, a, a silly desire. You can't rational. You can't make a rational excuse for procreation. Um, we can say of existence that existence is bad for them. Yeah, so, I mean, that's just a bold statement. Uh, but anyway, um, all right, once we acknowledge that coming into existence can be a harm, we might then want to speak loosely about never coming into existence being better. Um, so, yeah, so this is all part of a joke about, you know, uh, I, I just didn't get it, really, uh, about Freud, who made a joke about, you know, only 100,000 are so lucky as to never to exist. Um, and yeah, lots of people play word games that you know with this concept of being better off. Um, but yeah, there's scales here, and I think most people can do this math. They can figure out that if you mix this stuff together, you're not going to get a positive number. I mean, in net, and and that's really the thing is is you can't separate the worst of life from the rest of this stuff. It is the payment for your life, okay? The really, really, really bad stuff. And you can't just uh, excise that from your equation because it doesn't exist inside of you as some sort of fear. Because it's in the past. You don't think it's going to happen. Like if you have your appendix taken out, you're not going to worry that your appendix is going to go bad again, right? It's out of the way. It's, a, it's eliminated as a problem. Um, but the fact is, the experience of having your first one out, <laughs> um, you just can't excise that from the cost of your existence. Mm, yeah, anyway. All right, uh, there is nothing nonsensical about claiming that nobody is lucky enough never to have come into existence. So, yeah, it's just this little word play about, you know, 
if you don't exist, how can you be lucky? Or how can you be better? Or how can you be anything if you don't exist? But, yeah, I mean, it's just obvious that, yeah, the fact that you do exist means that there's an alternative of not exist. So that it's almost like that is your automatic shadow. You can't escape the automatic shadow. Once you exist, the automatic shadow is the fact that now you could have not existed. Um, so that is now an entity, even though it isn't an entity. It is because it is connected to the fact that once you are something, now there is the alternative of you not being. Yeah, once, you, once you're being, there is now the alternative of not being. Yeah, good. See, he should have wrote that in here. Anyway, <laughs> um, what lies in the balance is the presence and absence of vast amounts of harm. So that's really what this is about. It's about the fact that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge price paid for our existence. So we can just go with the human price of, you know, the, the thousands of one in a thousand kind of syndromes. Okay, catch, scratch, fever. Um, people still even get polio still, right? Um, but, you know, all the oh, elephant man disease, you can go down, ooh, all kinds of horrible conditions, all kinds of uh, terrible states of being, um, uh, you know, born retarded. Uh, you know, I saw somebody live that life, you know, born profoundly retarded, uh, 25, 30 surgeries to keep them alive for 18 years, um, horribly miserable, tormented creature. I mean, yeah, you couldn't give me a billion dollars to live that life. Even about a week of that life, you couldn't give me a billion dollars to live. Um, so right there, whew, huge failure. Huge, catastrophic failure. All right, uh, the positive features of life, although good for those who exist, cannot justify the negative features that accompany them. Um, yeah, I think I just said that, so yeah. Uh, right. You, you know, if you put this stuff realistically on the scales, if we did the whole evaluations, um, it's just not going to, it's not going to look good, all right, to a rational brain. The only way we make it look good is we allow our desire, our hunger, the fact that we still want something out of it, push the scales. And people ought to have the honesty to admit that their desire compels them, uh, to quote the exorcist. Um, anyway, um, guaranteed way to prevent all suffering of their children is not to bring their, these children into existence. Goes kind of without saying, okay? You don't take the risk, you don't have a Fukushima, right? Don't build the nuclear power plants, no risk of one blowing up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and the fact is, is we just don't need it. There's no rational need. It's a need that has, serves no need. It doesn't serve a need. It only serves human ambition, human ego, human nonsense, human bullshit, human crap. It doesn't serve anything real. There's no write downable um, sentence you can compose that, said, that, that makes it rationally clear why the human race needs to exist. There's, there's nothing for the human race to do but clean up the mess of sentience on planet Earth. It's evolutionary mess. The, the, the evolution that led to its existence is the only blight in the universe. The only thing capable of creating blight. Um, it's like building a nuclear power plant that produces no energy and just creates jobs for humans cleaning up the mess they make. That's how ludicrous life is. It is unintelligent design. That should be another context word here is that all these fake atheists <laughs> defending this imposition, uh, the fake atheist of the imposition. Maybe that would be a good title for a video. Um, yeah, this is unintelligent design. All right, so sort of the burden of proof is on you guys to say how did unintelligent forces, here's proof that unintelligent forces are actually creating something necessary, vital, important, valuable, um, all of those kind of good words. Okay, because retards generally don't do that. Uh, thus, any pair of procreators can view themselves as occupying the tip of a um, generational iceberg of suffering. So he's also just making the point that, yeah, I've said this too, the Adam and Eve syndrome. I mean, every couple can make a billion people, and they're essentially responsible for what those billions of people do, uh, what these ancestors of theirs do, how many Hitlers there are, how many mass murderers there are, how many... Uh, kids born with their brains outside their head kind of thing. Um, yeah, 
that's all on them okay they they created all of that slop um, and uh, I don't think most people um, if you showed them their lineage forward I don't think most people would be too proud of it especially under our current circumstances because you know your future lineage is basically going to be some sort of cockroach Anyway, if one does not desist from having children, one can hardly expect one's descendants to do so. So that's just making the argument that this is all unsustainable growth in a way, too. Is that what's your expectations here? You know, this this isn't going to work, and it can't work in the long run. Um, you know, unless c catastrophe really just starts annihilating your descendants, um, this is all unsustainable growth. Well, he doesn't really say that part. But I'm I'm adding that part, <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so we're up to uh, we'll say page eight. Okay, that reminded me where I am of the introduction. Yeah, yeah. This really will take a year. No, I really, really try to speed it up a little. Um, and I'm going to do the other guy's book too, in parallel, the Crawford guy. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's volume two. Thank you very much. Till next time. And such composers, imposters of the imposition.